The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. Of course, I'm your host and producer, Al Warren, and co-hosting today, we've got uh, David North Martino. Hey, Alan. Thanks for having me. Uh, now, today's book we're covering is Britain's Unsolved Murders, and we've got uh, the author with us all the way from the UK, Kevin Turton. Thank you for being here, Kevin. That's a pleasure. Kevin, first of all, uh, you, you've never been on the show before, so maybe let's, let's tell the listeners who you are like, and, and how you got into um, writing about unsolved murders. Well, I, I, I've been writing about unsolved crime, or crime generally, I should say, for the last 20 odd years, I suppose. And um, I, I first started back in the 90s. I was interested in the local crime. That's what triggered everything really for me. And discovering what that crime was about and how it happened, when it happened. Uh, and also finding that most of what I've been told was nonsense. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, well, but, but, <laughs> what do you mean by that exactly? Like, what, well, what, part what of I mean it? is that, that uh, uh, I was I was looking at a crime that was started uh, back in the early 1900s. It was really, but my family had talked about it, or everyone had always talked about it. I, I lived near the site, and I discovered through research uh, a valuable lesson, I think, and that is that. It's the research that counts, because what people tell you about anecdotally uh, is often not accurate. So there were some kind of glaring errors in what people believed about that particular crime. And from there, that kind of taught me that if I was going to get involved in looking at this and writing about it, the research would be key. Well, how do you how do you determine what's real and what's not? Uh, and and I mean that like you're saying, you, you hear about a um, a murder, you know, you hear the, the the tales and the stories about some sort of killing and something, and that. But how do you know what what to count on? Well, I, I think when you begin doing something like that, you, you're not quite sure of anything. Anything you don't know whether anything's really factual, but what you have is a timeline. You have a start date. So most people are reasonably accurate when they can tell you that it happened in such and such a date or in such and such a place. And that is generally the start point, really, because from there you go to the press, the newspapers, because essentially they will tell you the story, depending how far back you're going. If you look at it uh, in modern day, uh, today you get very little information through newspapers, but going back into the 30s, 40s and so on, you get a lot more information. So I find that is always my start point. Yeah, and what, but what can you trust? You know, um, for instance, uh, an example is I've been watching the um, Netflix uh, on Oscar Pistorius. There's that four-part mm. documentary. And in part two, um, you know, after the murder or the, 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 the his girlfriend that was killed, um, you had the police coming out saying that there had been uh, calls to the residents before about, uh, you know, domestic abuse. And this is the police telling the media, but, at this, at, but the truth was it, that never had happened. That, mm. was, that was wrong. So a lot of times things come out of mistakes, and, and it's, it's hard to, uh, to know what to trust. I think, yeah, I get the point. You're right. Uh, there, there is a lot of kind of information that circulates around a crime um, that is inaccurate. What you're trying to do is to get the core of it, isn't it? That's really what you're looking for. You're looking for you know, where does this sit, what happened, how did it happen? Um, all that anecdotal information and, and the what is presented by people who are around the circumstances of that crime. I think you have to, or from where I sit, you kind of set it aside. I mean, I, I always tend to write on crime between 1850 and 1960. So I stay within sort of 110 years, wherever I can. Uh, um, and 
So from a point of view of learning the truth, it comes from the records that are available to me, really. Yeah. Now, I noticed... It, 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 Sorry, go it, on. It, I was going to say, I noticed in this book you've got 13 um, cold cases. You, you call yeah. Them. How do you choose which ones you're going to write about? Like, what is it about a case that makes you go, yeah, this, this should be in the book? Well, in the unsolved, in the book on the unsolved, I was, I was looking for murders that, for me, create a puzzle. And, and every one of these cases is a puzzle, by virtue of the fact, obviously, they're unsolved in the first instance. But some of these crimes ended up in court. People were brought to court for some of these murders. Um, and the resultant cases found them not guilty. And the more you look at some of these crimes, you begin to understand why, because they were and still are uh, a, a real puzzle, a real mystery about these crimes. And that's for me, was choosing cases that would give me that kind of mysterious edge. Wow, it's it's quite that now. Now crime is treated quite a bit differently. It's funny you say that, eighteen fifty seven to nineteen fifty seven, that kind of uh, hundred years. Yeah, it was treated quite a bit differently back in let's say eighteen seventy as compared to nineteen fifty. It was. Yeah, it was. It it, it was. You found <laughs> the when you go back into the eighteen hundreds, um, the. These were, were, were rather difficult cases if you were brought to court to prove your innocence. Um, it got easier as you got into the 20th century, but it was certainly very difficult during the 1800s. Uh, and, of course, the rules were different. Uh, um, in some of the cases early on, as a defendant, you didn't even have counsel uh, when the case first came to court. So you were on a kind of loser to start with. Uh, and that made those cases more difficult. And there were, well, from what I, where I sit, uh, some of them were proven guilty when you read it and you can't quite believe that the jury would have done that. Others less so. It was a difficult time, there's no doubt about it. When you come into the 20th century, things change. You have better counsel, you have better barristers, you have court cases that were... Um, more intense in a way, and evidence and the way you collected evidence had changed. Was there anything uh, when you're when you're doing research on some of these older cases? What, what was kind of um, the biggest surprise you got? And I mean that toward maybe let's say uh, how how the case is handled toward you know the process or or how the police did their job or how the court did. Was there any sort of things that you were sort of shocked by? I think it was probably the way the police handled a lot of these cases because um, they, compared to today, <clears throat> uh, we have to remember, of course, that they didn't have access to what police forces here today have access to. But they, they were sort of, they very readily believed guilt. Uh, and it, it, from a police force, uh, particularly in the 1800s, 1850 to 1900, around that time, uh, I, I think the surprise to me was how quickly sometimes people were almost gathered in uh, and arrested for crimes. And uh, Whereas in the 20th century, we demand far more of the police before you can do that. So I guess that was kind of the thing that, uh, I, I, again, I realized early on that there's a really big difference between an investigation from 1870 and an investigation from 1950. Yeah, it's pretty, pre pretty amazing, the changes. Um, I, I really like that uh, Murder, Mystery and Family show that's on um, in the UK where they're, they're going over old cases and deciding yeah. whether or not they're safe or not. I love that concept of it. Of, of what they do there. That's, uh, yeah. Uh, well, now, I, it, uh, yeah. Go on. No, I was going to say, go ahead. I was... No, I was going to say, I, I agree with you. I, I think that there is a fascination, isn't there, with, with, from all of our points of view, we're all kind of fascinated with what, what is a horrendous crime. 
And when they pick over the bones of a case like that, um, I, I find it quite fascinating. I suppose that's why I write about it. I find it quite fascinating. And I think so do most people. Uh, so now I was looking at some of the cases, like one of the ones that uh, have mentioned uh, for that book uh, would have been the murder of John Gill and uh, Madeline Smith. Uh, that was a pretty interesting case. Um, and it, it was really more of a lack of proof than anything. Um, maybe maybe uh, tell us a little bit about that case. Well, the John Gill case is depending where you come from, I suppose, is some people were regarded as a Jack the Ripper murder. Um, I think Patricia Cornwall viewed it in a similar way when she wrote about the Ripper. Because it is a, it, but it is a peculiar murder in that sense. John Gill was a young boy uh, who used to go out in the morning and ride around with the milkman. Now, the milkman, of course, at that time, used to come around with the horse and cart. So he, he knew the milkman quite well, and that's how he spent his early mornings. Um, when he disappeared, uh, it, it obviously caused an enormous manhunt around the area, which is uh, uh, in the north of England, around Bradford. And when he was discovered, he was, well, horribly mutilated. I mean, he had been murdered, he had been stabbed, he had been dissected, and he had been wrapped up. In a, in a very peculiar way, and left for the police to find. As an aside to the John Gill, there had also been an incident in uh, the town of Jack the Ripper, i.e. someone had gone into someone's house and had left a note claiming to be Jack the Ripper. So it has, it's always had Jack the Ripper connotations. Uh, the police actually did bring people in from London to look at it because they too had suspicions that it could well have been a Jack the Ripper murder. But there's nothing really about the John Gill killing that would ever be associated with it, in my opinion, because it's not the kind of murder that Jack the Ripper would do. But Jack the Ripper at the time was so big as a crime all over England that everyone knew about Jack the Ripper. And so they automatically pointed the finger in that direction. The belief locally, of course, was that it was the milkman that had murdered him. And it is quite possible that, that it was. But there really was no evidence in, in support of that. And so the crime remained unsolved. And I just wanted to go back. Uh, in the introduction to uh, Britain's Unsolved Murders, uh, you go through a short history of uh, cr the, fr uh, the crime fiction genre. Yeah. Could you, could you tell us a little of that history and how it relates to readers' interest in uh, true unsolved crimes? Well, I, I think that um, from, a, from a fiction point of view, like I said a, a, a while ago, there's always been an interest in true crime. But it, it, when you look at the fiction side of it, it kind of builds up, doesn't it? It goes through periods... Uh, and it, it, it grows as the years go by. So you, you, it begins with uh, no detective work at all, because there was no detective work. It begins just with the crime. And then writers began to look at how you could investigate crime. They invented the detectives to go with it. And you started to create what we see as a modern genre of true crime. Um, how, how it works with unsolved crime to me, is that you tell the story in a very similar way, uh, but you don't have a conclusion at the end of it. Uh, um, so anyone writing about true crime, you're able to, in some ways, you can approach it in an almost Agatha Christie way, because you can write about what, all the facts that you've got uh, in a similar way to, to the way a fiction writer would approach it, but you have to work chronologically with a timeline. So there's obviously going to be a difference. And I think that the, there is a, there's a kind of a mix between the two from a reader's point of view, because a lot of people like to read about crime. If they didn't, we wouldn't watch true crime on TV in the guise of fiction, you know, i.e. Morse and Endeavour and things that are on TV over here, uh, um, which are very popular. And 
when anything comes onto TV, which is true crime, I think it automatically attracts a, an audience, if you like, from the fiction market into the true crime market. There is an overlap of sorts. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so that's how I think it works. I mean, uh, when you look on the TV, I can go down and put the TV on, and I've got FBI files on tonight. Uh, uh, I, we've had on Inspector Morse, and there's a difference between the two. One's real and one isn't. But nevertheless, the audience for both are probably very similar. Hmm. I wonder, what do you think the fascination with the true crime is, uh, especially lately, the big surge in it the last 10 years? I think we're like a mystery. I think the whole thing, the way that the, 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 you look at crime is, like you start from the point of view that you know it's a heinous, horrible crime and you would not want to be involved in murder in any way, shape or form. But when the story is told, it is often told as a mystery because you do not know who's committed. Even if you're watching true crime, like I said, I can watch the FBI files and they will tell it in an almost fictional way. Uh, this is the crime. This is what happened. There's a timeline. These are the people involved. And, and as an audience, you follow that timeline in the same way that you would fiction. And, and I think that's what draws an audience in. We kind of put it, we kind of forget, don't we? We kind of leave aside the fact that this is horrendous. And we, we are, we, we sort of come into the, the whole mystery angle of it. And I, I think that's what it's all about, really. I think that's why people are fascinated by it. How do you deal with it? Um, like when you're when you're writing these cases and you know they've really happened and you're researching and stuff like that. I guess a lot of the older ones you don't have any people that you are still alive. Maybe some of the later ones from from later closer yeah. to 1960. But, um, True. How, how is it that? Do, do any of them affect you um, when you're writing them and researching them? Yes. Yes, they do. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I think that I've always tried to, to take the approach when I write about crime that wherever possible, I want to see the scene. I want, even though it's years later, I want to go to where it happened. I want to know more about it. Um, and I'm trying to do that. I can't always do it, but I'm trying to do it wherever possible so I can understand about it and then it's down to trying to understand as much as i can the people that were involved what was their situation in life and what were the social standings at the time were they wealthy were they poor how, how did they live their life in other words um and the more you dig in the more you discover and then trying to find out about the victim where you can uh, and, and in a similar understanding, to try to understand why the thing happened in the first place and the circumstances around it. But, yeah, some of these things that you look at, they certainly do live with you for a while. No doubt about that. Well, and I, I, I would imagine in, on the older cases, too, you really have to get um, into knowing what was going on. Let's say if it was something that happened in London and, 1860 yeah. you kind of have to know how london was in 1860 you have to know what people did on their day-to-day -day and what kind of life people in general lived. like how did they um and that in itself must take a lot of time yeah it does uh, it takes a lot of research to try to understand uh, people's circumstances and uh, particularly on a local level as well because um like you say looking at how was london or whatever uh, you also need to expand that and then have a look at, you pick the location, you know, what, where your crime took place, what was happening in that particular part of London or Bradford or wherever it was, um, and, and understand how people were living. What, were, what was the housing like? What, what were the pressures on their life that caused that particular crime, if there were any? Um, and... It's not as difficult as it seems in some ways because you've got you've got the newspapers obviously which are an easy in because you can understand what was going on just by reading local newspapers, and it gives you an all a really good idea of what it was. You can do the research on 
what the housing situation was. But it's getting under the skin of the people that's the hardest thing to try to do, I think. Try to understand where they were coming from, what were they really like. And um, I, I enjoy the research, but it is, as I say, it is true that on some cases you do walk away and, you, you know, you lose sleep sometimes, even though it's a long time ago. I wonder, um, you know, um, times have changed. You know, they didn't, you know, they're not living with cell phones and a lot of them didn't have running water or power and there's such a different lifestyle. But has murder changed? Well, it has in a way, yes. I think perhaps it's changed in a way that um, the way that it's carried out today perhaps is different. Uh, it, because number one is we've we've got more weaponry kicking around even in over here, and yeah. so it's, it, there is that. Um, and it seems in some ways sometimes there's more opportunity. So I think it's it has changed, but the circumstances behind it I don't think have, I, and the people involved, you know, people still feel the grief that you would have felt a hundred years ago. How do, how do you find, what, what, what would be the biggest cause of murder that you've come across? Is, is, is it always related to love? Well, quite often, yes. Um, the, it, I think that's probably, yeah, it, it's probably to do with family uh, more than anything else. Um, I think they always say, don't they, you know, that the murderer is usually within a, a close proximity of the family or within the family. And quite often that, that's true. And love or lack of or jealousy tends to play a major role in a lot of these things all the time. So, yes, I think that's true today. And I think it was true of yesteryear as well. I was going to say, it seemed like a, a big uh, murder weapon uh, back then uh, was arsenic. Arsenic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the, you always look at poison is, tends to be a weapon used by a woman, doesn't it? I mean, that tends to be the way that society tends to view it. And arsenic was readily available during the uh, 19th century. And it was used by a number of people, as we all know, in various crimes. Although I think a number of murders took place back then, or were claimed to be murdered, that were not, because arsenic was in lots and lots of different things. <laughs> and uh, accidental death could all, could then look like murder. Uh, once they have got past uh, um, 1850 onwards, where they could identify arsenic in the body, um, you tended to get more people being brought to justice. But not, I don't think they always were guilty. Uh, I think by and large, um, it, you, it was a kind of um, an easy substance to use. And I think that's why people used it, because it was in wheat color, wasn't it? It was in wallpaper. It was in all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was surprised at how common it was. People would just yeah. buy it, and they, they used it for all sorts of things. And and uh, But another thing I've noticed, you know, and I used to think um, – that they had pretty good, uh, like Dr. Spilsbury is quite, quite popular over there. And I know that um, he did a lot of these well-known cases. Like he did a lot of the medical examinations or the uh, toxicology, I guess you'd call it. Um, wh wh what's your thought on Spilsbury now? Well, I, from what I've read of him, I, I think that um, our methods today are perhaps a little better than the ones he was using at the time. Um, but nevertheless, uh, he was, he's one of the first names you come across as someone who was delving into this particular area or, or was creating a science that, would, that, would, that you could use. That doesn't necessarily mean he was always deadly accurate, I suppose. Right. Yeah, it seemed, it seemed to me like he was very, he really got into a, a celebrity sort of status. Yeah, I, yeah, you're probably right there. Uh, um, he 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 was famous in his day. 
Yeah, yeah, it certainly seemed that way. Uh, they, the, the people really hung on his every word. And I think, like you said, a lot of times they weren't necessarily right yeah. um, with their uh, reports. The science hadn't come far enough. But um, if, if he thought it was that way, then a lot of people thought it was that way then. They just sort of went with it. I think you're right. Yes, I mean, the name carried everything, didn't it? Yeah. So if he said it, you believed it. Exactly. That's kind of how, I, that was my impression anyway. Um, but, you know, who knows? And who knows what it was like to be that kind of celebrity back then, but it seemed like he had a lot of pull, um, you know. Yeah, what, I think what, he did. What, what, was, what was kind of the... Um, I don't want to say your favorite case, but of the 13 cases you chose for the unsolved uh, murders, um, what was, is there any one or two cases that really stuck out for you? Well, I think that um, there's, there's a case in here which was the baby killer, um, which was the murder of uh, Reese Brandish, who was a small child, by uh, a nurse known as Elizabeth Brandish, and it was a murder from 1897. That stayed with me for a long time because, and she was found not guilty at two trials, but she definitely did it. <laughs> no doubt about it. She murdered this child uh, um, because of the circumstances around her at the time. She had a, she'd been, for anyone that's, that's not familiar with the Elizabeth Brandish case, Elizabeth Brandish. Uh, had um, an affair when she was young, in which she got pregnant, she had a child. And then she wanted to move on in life. And so she farmed that child out. She paid a pound a, a pound a month, I think, or a pound a week for it. I can't quite remember now. But she sent it down to Kent, and they brought the child up, and she went on with her life. She became a nurse, fell in love, wanted to get married, and then realised she'd have a problem. So she went back to collect this child, and she killed it on a train coming home, and she got off with it. So I think that's one, one thing that's always stayed with me, because every fact I've ever read about this case tells you she had to have done this. But she was very fortunate in the fact that the jury, or a jury member, did not believe in capital punishment for women, and so she got off with that. I think on the others, I was fascinated by a couple of cases that were handled by the barrister Sir uh, Edward Marshall Hall, which was the Camden Town murder and the Kidwelly poisoning in Wales. Because I've, I've, I've always had a fascination for Edward Marshall Hall because he was an absolutely brilliant defence lawyer and defence barrister. Uh, and he got both these people off the, the charge of murder. And he did it superbly well. He was a showman in court. Uh, and I kind of enjoyed looking at those and uh, and researching those. And he, he did, he was often involved in murder trials in Britain, and invariably he won uh, cases of clear murder by confusing the jury, which, which was exactly <laughs> what he intended to do. I think at every murder trial, and generally, you know, he won. Yeah, still goes on today, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're probably right. You know, it's kind of crazy. Oh, and another thing, you know, I find fascinating um, was uh, it seems like uh, they would try someone. It would be fairly quick, uh, the whole trial, a couple of days or a week, and then they would convict them, and it seems like they were just hung almost right away. Yes, they were. Yeah, the, the rules were that... Um, Execution took place, well, certainly, <clears throat> put it into perspective, really, uh, in executions that were sort of pre-1900, you would probably live for two weeks in prison before you were executed. If you were in York, uh, you had three weeks. Uh, they were very quick. And there really was no appeal. Uh, that came in the 20th century. Sorry. No, I was just agreeing. I just, it's crazy. It just seemed like, okay, you're guilty, done. And yeah. now now they stay on death row for years. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah. I mean, you can fight your case now quite a lot. I, I, obviously, uh, uh, with death row prisons in America, it tends to go on forever. And um, 
we, we, our attitude has changed to it, hasn't it? You know, as a society. Whereas in the 19th century, we readily accepted executions. I mean, we did it publicly for a while. And even when we did it privately, uh, you could still see <laughs> if you got to the right place. And as a society, we bought into that. We seemed to, to grow and work with it. And uh, as we came through the 20th century, attitudes changed. We changed our views on things. And uh, it got more and more difficult. And obviously, they decided to not carry on. I just wonder how it would be, but I almost don't know, um, you know, because I'm up in Canada and there's no death penalty either, but I just wonder of in society, how much of society would be involved if they were hanging people again or executing them and uh, would watch, you know, uh, the old days where you could go out and watch someone being hung. Uh, yeah. gone but i wonder if they if they i could see this is terrible to say but i could see it in the states being on pay-per-view and doing really well. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't think yeah, I'm so wrong. Can I. <laughs> you know and i don't think i'm wrong like it seems like Enough. there's this society that's like okay we don't believe in killing people we're a civilized society but yet you know that um, and I think it's because of that. I think it's because that we don't kill them so much anymore. And I think it's a lot of people feel um, that culprits get away with these crimes. They're guilty, but yet they, 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 they get away with it. So I think there's this feeling of, of watching them be killed almost. And there's this it's the gladiator sort of feeling. Um, I don't know. That's just kind of my impression. No, I think you're probably right. I think I think that there is, from what you said, it, there is a, a, a view that executions perhaps should be brought back. Um, whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. Um, I think certainly I go along with the idea that in America it would be on pay per view, and I think people would pay to see it. <laughs> I think that that's a good business in that, especially to stay home with the, with the, with the pandemic. I'll tell you, there's, there's good, good, good entertainment value there. Get, you know, I, I, I you know, we, maybe they'll hire me as one of the hosts for the. Why <laughs> not? No, I don't know. I don't know if I'm really. <laughs> ah, anyway, so that's it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty crazy. Um, I, I have to wonder, but like, um, what, what, what about? these unsolved cases um is the draw for you so like when you write a book like britain's unsolved murders is there something you want people to take away from the book other than you know the actual crime and what had happened and what the evidence is but is there something like when i read that book um is there something you want me to get out of that book i want you to try to see how difficult it was to actually solve the crime. Um, what I've tried to do with all of these is to express an opinion at the end of every chapter, really, where I can. To say, look, this is what I think happened, or this is what I think could have happened. And I think, I, I, when anyone reads these, I, I want them to try to understand that there is, and always will be, a mystery to this particular case. And they're not as easy to solve as they seem. And I want them to form an opinion if they can. Uh, read it and then say, yeah, I, I agree with what Kevin's saying here. I think he's right or disagree with me. But I want them to think about it. That's where I'm trying to get at, really, is that I've chosen cases here which have a story. They have a story to tell. And people, really, who've been let down by the system because no one solved this crime, or did they? Were they right in what they said at the time where they brought people to trial? And that's a question for the reader to try and answer as well. Uh, and in the cases where there's simply never been an arrest, why has there never been an arrest? What is it about this case that makes, uh, it, makes it go cold, that the police eventually close the file and put it onto the unsolved section? Um, you know, you look at some of these things in here. I mean, I, 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 one of them that stick comes to mind is uh, um, talking about uh, the case of uh, Florence Nightingale's niece who was killed and never solved. The crime never, never solved. Uh, and yet you can look at it and say, well, 
surely they should have been able to work out how this murder took place. Um, but they never seem to have done it, you know. So the idea there was to say, I'm going to write about these. I These people all need justice, should have justice, but we fail them somewhere along the line. And this is the truth of the matter. Here's the story. What do you think about it? What would be your opinion? How do you think um, the media affects all of this? Um, and, and I mean that in a way of... Um, it's 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 more so, of course, in 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 the U.S. Um, you know, U.K. and and Canada have more of a, a restriction on what the media can do and say during crimes. Um, but do 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 you think that there should be an open courtroom for everyone? It should be televised as it goes, and 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 do do you think that affects the way it turns out? I don't know that I would go along with TV trials. I mean. Um... Although I did watch the O.J. Simpson one, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people did, yeah. <laughs> I think the, the, the problem, to some extent, for modern-day press is they almost have made up their mind who's done certain things before anyone gets to, gets to trial here. You know, you read things in the paper about a murder and then you're following the case because they named the person they've arrested and this guy or woman never gets... Uh, chance before they get to trial, which I think is uh, it's unfair in a way. Um, so I, I think the press, of the way they handle cases today, obviously they do it a lot different than we would have done 100 years ago. Of course they do. Uh, our attention spans are not the same as they were 100 years ago, and we've got different sources to find out things. Um, but I think, yes, I think the media do have an influence. There's no doubt about it in my mind on some cases. Uh, before the case ever gets to court. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I almost think that I would prefer if they didn't even get involved, if they weren't allowed to do yeah. anything. I, I would like them to televise, let's say, but not until after the case was done. You know, like record hmm. it and then present it after it's been there's been a, a verdict. So they've decided guilty or not, and then they release the, the videos and people can watch it. Um, I think that would be better because right now you see, look at even the OJ case, right? Yeah. Everybody got so involved and they, and you know, Marsha Clark was, uh, you know, and the, even the judge, Ito, everybody was aware that they were being watched and they were all yeah. performing for the camera. They were performing for what they thought they should do and what they would hear and the feedback that they would get, they would act accordingly so so they're no longer focusing on what they're doing the, the actual trial and the and the crime they're focusing on the presentation and i i, I just think it's that's the problem yeah i agree, I agree with you because it's uh, they're almost they're more aware of their tv presence aren't they really yeah. they know that they're going to have an audience out there so you dress for the audience you do you present your case for the audience i i go along with you i i agree i i I think that we gave some of these cases partial publicity, and it, it cannot help long term. Yeah, so, you know, and I, I've interviewed some of them. It's crazy uh, after the the trial and stuff. And and I remember even the Jody Arias case had huge um, uh, watching and and people watching and an audience and and you know the defense lawyer it's like you know they are complain about his tie or his haircut or did he gain weight yeah. or did he yeah and and that all affected him totally um, yeah and how could it not you know because if you're just a a normal guy doing your job and all of a sudden you're on tv 24 7 and everybody in the country knows you hmm. um how could that not uh affect you you know yeah just, i quite agree you know. it's far more it must be far more difficult today to be a defendant in a case that's caught the public imagination, if you like, or certainly the media attention. Um, I've often worried in the sense of the free trial, the kind of, not free trial, what am I trying to say, whether or not they get a fair trial. Yeah. Because by the time the case actually hits the court, all these jury members must have read about it. Lots. Yeah. And so that, you, you wonder whether or not that influences opinion. 
Well, well, it has to in a way because yeah, I would think how, so. However, it's presented to you. I mean, if you're watching it and uh, you know whoever's on, you know uh, Nancy Grace or whoever's on there, and they have a negative opinion of that person, it's going to come across that way. And mm. if you like the presenter on the show, you will tend to to agree. And so you, you don't really know the evidence. You just it's you know what I mean. It's all secondary and yes, and and you just kind of it sways the way you feel, and then I think that in itself. So how could I really give a fair verdict? Um, I, I don't know. It's a, I think it's a tough one. It is, yes. And I, but the press are guilty sometimes of they don't really present the truth of a case. They're selective in their reporting because quite often what you read in the paper is not what actually comes out in court. So they are careful. And, of course, the police are not able or willing to give away too much. So they, they tend to, you tend to get, I think, certainly over here, you tend to get a lot of publicity about a case and a, and a lot of kind of bits and pieces that are maybe factual, maybe not factual. Um, and you, you can make your mind up about it well before the trial from what you've read, only to find that actually in court, a lot of what you've read is not necessarily true. I don't know how yeah, one remedies yeah. that, but I think that's what the press... Too, they are selling newspapers. Do you think they handled uh, celebrity uh, cases, celebrity murders, like the Florence Nightingale's um, niece, like in the 1920s? Do you feel that they handled them differently than today? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, there's no doubt about it, really. I mean, uh, I think with the, the Florence Nightingale thing, what angers me about that particular case is that you know, we're talking here about a woman who had dedicated her life to nursing. She'd been uh, at the front line of the First World War since 1914. She'd been at the Boer War. This woman had dedicated her whole life to looking after men in war, and not just Brits. She'd looked after the Germans at the end of the First World War. Very, very brave woman. Uh, and she did not deserve to be beaten to death on a train. The press handled it um, differently, partly because she was a, a Florence Nightingale family. And Florence Nightingale has always been a big hero. So she was portrayed in a similar way in this country. But I couldn't find the kind of debate in the press back then that you would get today about that crime. So they do handle it, it was handled differently. The tragedy of it is that no one ever solved it. Kind of sad, really. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's sort of the whole, yeah, you know, the whole thing with true crime. And people are all out, you know, all the armchair detectives and everybody likes watching it and they're all trying to solve it and stuff like that. Um, but I think it's really important that um, people do a little more research before they jump to conclusions you know it's it's so much different when you actually go like you said to the to the scene of the crime or if you see people or you, it's just it's different live than it is yeah. seeing it on television absolutely i quite agree um i think that once you get near to to the crime or or as near as you can get you you start to understand it in much greater detail. Um, you know, I'll give you an example of that. I looked at a, a murder not far away from where I live, which is which is in the book, which is the uh, the murder of the Peach family, uh, George and Lillian Peach, who were murdered in their home. It's an appalling murder, and I went. That cottage is still there. I went out to see this place. I wanted to understand what it would have been like out there at the time of this murder because the landscape around it is absolutely unchanged because it's part of the Rothschild estate. And, and it, it's kind of a scary place when you get out somewhere like that, out in the middle of the countryside with just one house there uh, at midnight uh, on a cold winter's night, you really begin to understand a bit more about the case. Uh, and I've found that with wherever I've gone, that actually going to, to where these things have happened gives you a much greater sense of, how it must have been, and maybe the terror, you know, that, that took place. So, yeah, I mean, all these places, um, 
you know, they have kind of retained some kind of information, if that makes sense, the kind of information that you can only find when you go out there and look for yourself. Yeah, I think it, I think it, you can put it, um, how do I say it? It just get, it gets it gets wrapped up in your writing when you're writing about it because the feeling of of that area comes through. Yeah, I th- personally, I th- that's how I feel. So it kind yeah, of yeah, I agree. It does uh, because you you you're writing and you're under you. I think you've got more of an understanding. It's not just a written word because you've read something. You've actually gone and trod the ground, and you get a sense of. I get a sense anyway when I do it. I always get a sense of. Uh, um, I don't know what it is really. It's kind of you get a sense of danger sometimes. You get a sense of uh, what, what it would have been like, obviously, whenever this murder took place, and how the people around would have felt about it. I think it's quite a useful exercise for any writer that's looking at uh, true crime, if they can do it. Yeah, I yeah. notice a difference in the ones that I've been a part of where I've been there and doing things uh, it, it, because you can feel it. You put yourself into that place and you can understand it. If you're at the house, for instance, in the property, you can understand where the neighbors are, how far away they are. You can understand yeah. like the housing and, and where it happened. And it just, it, it comes alive for you in, in your mind. And I think that that's kind of what turns the corner. It is, isn't it? Because it's, it's when you read something that says, well, the nearest neighbour is 500 yards away. Well, it's meaningless until you actually go out there and actually see what that 500 yards really means. Right. And then you get more of a grip on it, I think. Yeah. Well, and you can you can tell whether, you know, if it's down a hill behind trees. Yeah. Like, it's just, 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 just the whole feel of where you're at. And you could sit there and kind of imagine, okay, so this is how it happened. And you can sort of see it happening in your mind, whereas mm. not being there, it's missing. And I've noticed a difference in, in books that I've been a part of. They're much better because of that than the ones that I've written just strictly from court records. And, and yeah, yeah, stuff quite. Like that. It, there's, there's a little bit more of me in it, and that's from the feeling I get from being there. So yeah. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can go along with that because I feel the same. Yeah. Um, okay, so now, Kevin, do you, do you yourself have a website of your own or any, any sort of place that you like people to come and, and stalk you? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Being that it's website. murder and crime, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have a website, that? which is uh, kevinturtontruecrime.com. Okay. And what we'll do is we'll put that up on our website as well. You know, people listening can find okay. you and stuff like that. Um, I, you know, you, a very interesting conversation. Love to have you back. I know I see you've written a lot of books. And uh, the South Yorkshire, that, that sounds so interesting to me because of the, um, the, the how you talk about the, the dark corners, about the, the witches and body snatchers and highwaymen and, Oh yes, yes. <laughs> just this is the concept. It just puts you in that mood where this is great. You know, this is like a, a dark shadows adventure, and uh, I think that's awesome. But what are you what are you working on now? Well, at the moment, I'm I'm doing some research on um, what is called a witchcraft murder, uh, which Perfect. took place in 1945, I think it is, and it's okay. It's a case that was handled by a, a, a very famous detective here, which is Robert Fabian. So I'm, I'm currently looking at that because I, I, it's always fascinated me. I've written about it before, um, but I'd like to do it in a bit more depth and understand it. It's unsolved again. And it was known as the witchcraft murder, but there was I don't think there was anything to do with witchcraft in it, to be honest. <laughs> there was a witch there somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's a, it's a lonely little village that had um, an association with witchcraft. But it's like anything else. You know, you the more I've read about this by other writers that have written bits and pieces about it, who always look at it as it's a witchcraft killing, the more I've discovered is it's not really a witchcraft killing. It's a killing made to look like a witchcraft killing. So I'm looking at that. Well, that sounds pretty interesting. That's, uh, I like that. Um, just fascinating. Um, well, it's been a pleasure uh, having you on the show. and uh, Thank you very much. And, and, and we hope to have you again. This is uh, 
a great, uh, Any time. great, great subject. Um, our guest tonight or today has been Kevin Turton, and uh, the book we were talking about was Britain's Unsolved Murders, but he has so much more. So thank you for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Kevin. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. <laughs> The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.